Good morning. morning. I'm Pastor Vern Christofferson, interim pastor here at Good Shepherd. Welcome to worship. It's good to be together this morning. We're celebrating communion today, so know if you happen to be a visitor, you are certainly welcome to join us in this meal. And if you happen to be streaming, get out some crackers and juice, some bread and some wine, and join us for this meal. A few announcements of upcoming events. We're commissioning the transition team this morning. Right now the team is working through the findings of Pastor Scott Olson and the shepherding team. So thank you for that work that you've done before. It certainly helps us as we get started. On October 10th, uh, Thursday, October 10th, 1.30 in the afternoon, there's a salute to seniors. We're gathering for worship and we're celebrating communion. We're gathering for of all, friends that we maybe haven't seen in quite a while. Call the church office and reserve a spot and let us know if you need a ride. We're doing our best to get those lined up for you. And then finally, on Sunday, October 13th, it's a come and sing with the choir Sunday morning. All you got to do is show up at 9, 10 in the morning. There's going to be a simple song and it's a chance to sing in the choir and uh, not even practice ahead of time. So come join in and uh, be a part of that fun and uh, making a joyful noise to the Lord. We appreciate it in advance. Again, that's Sunday, October 13th. Those are our announcements. I would invite you to stand for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Spirit. Let us confess our sin and come to God for healing. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflicts and disputes. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs of the poor and the suffering last. In your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw near to us with grace in time of need. And turn us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God promises to forgive our iniquity and to remember our sin no more. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of eternal healing, your son.
Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Jesus, sometimes it can be hard to humble ourselves and serve others. Priorities and a lack of time can get in the way. So can our own uncertainties about what we might have to offer others. Give us someone today whom we can serve, and give us the strength and the will to do it. Amen. A reading from James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, it is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? They do not come from your cravings that are at war within you. You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder, and you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to see. He will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. I invite any children that are here today to come forward for children's time. Come on up. Well, we got one of you here. I know we got some visitors here today. It's a little harder to compare when you're a visitor. So I got a question for you today. Do you know what it is to serve? Do you know what that means? What does it mean? It means like to like, like if they 
ask you to serve them food, you get food for them? To serve. Anybody out there got another answer? I'll come and give you a microphone if you got one. Because one person up here is kind of kind of hard. Anybody want to raise your hand? I'll come out real quick. Anybody? What does it mean to serve? Tammy, you know. What does it mean to serve? Be brave. To help other people. To help other people. That sounds like a great answer. Anybody else? What's a good answer? What does it mean to serve? Yeah, well, that's our theme for today. We are called to serve. And uh, it can mean lots of different things. But let me just tell you a little story. I, we have, of course, cell phones in our confirmation class. And they have to put them someplace during worship and, and during class because they can't be on their phones during those times. It sounds a little bit like some of the school challenges these days. So one day I asked the quilters, if pretty cool, way to go, Diane and the rest of the quilters, let's give them a hand for their serving. And I will tell you this, this was full last Wednesday night, and there wasn't a single cell phone that got left behind, so way to go. It's certainly helpful. Their names are all on there. They know where to put them, and it's a great way to be of service, as there are lots of other ways in our world. Thanks for coming up and being brave today. Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Then they went to Capernaum, and when he was in a house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another over who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, 
Whoever wants to be first must be lacking it in his arms, he said to them. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. I have a microphone case that doesn't open very readily, so Kent, you want to work on that while we go on with the sermon? Kent, thank you for your help. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, in the midst of your call to serve, there are always things that show up in our world, always opportunities, always challenges, and we wonder what it is that we might do and how it is that we might serve. Give us someone today, Lord, whom we can serve. Amen. Back in 1989, I ran into somebody great. No, it wasn't a rock star or a movie star or best to meet Herb Chilstrom. In those days, the ELCA was a new church body. I'd never met Bishop Chilstrom before. But he was going to be preaching at the closing worship service of one of my dad's two last congregations, St. Peter Lutheran in, in rural Vermilion, South Dakota. After 120 years on the South Dakota prairie, St. Peter was closing its doors. Is that working? Yes, I think it is. Thank you, Kent, for saving the day. And uh, I won't go back to the beginning, but close to it. <laughs> After 120 years on the South Dakota Prairie, St. Peter was closing its doors. And it just so happened to be the home congregation of Kareen Chilstrom, the bishop's wife. I went to that service partly to support my dad and partly out of curiosity. <laughs> Eventually others had the same curious curiosity because instead of the usual 68, six to eight people in the church, there were 400 worshipers crammed in, plus a half dozen television cameras. 
With all the excitement, I sincerely doubted I'd even get close to the bishop. Looked up when I was in the church basement eating my chicken dinner, and who should come walking my way but Herb and Corrine Chilstrom? And they sat down right beside us. I introduced them to myself and my family, including my two young children. I was basking in the moment. I was trying to think of something smart or witty to talk about with this great man. But alas, before the Chilstrons had even taken a bite of their food, my six-year-old son Eric promptly dropped a chicken drumstick onto the floor, and it landed right between the bishop's shoes. I tried every which way to kind of nonchalantly slide that drumstick out of the way, but to no avail. The bishop finally looked under the table. He grabbed the napkin, picked it of it. He got his drumstick back. But I was more than a little embarrassed. I should mention one more detail of my brush with greatness. It happened later that afternoon at the closing worship service. Bishop Chilstrom was preaching. A big part of his sermon focused on the need for followers of Jesus to be the servants they are called to be. After all, he said, that's what kept St. Peter going for the past 120 years. The bishop acknowledged, celebrated the faith of those servants, their determination to work together, their striving to get along, even when the way before them was anything but easy or clear. We've long since forgotten many of their names, he said, but it was those servants laboring in the name of Jesus Christ, who had made this place such a tremendous blessing for a world was over. But I did leave with a better understanding of greatness. For this newly elected presiding bishop, greatness was first and foremost not in status, not in some glitzy office building in Chicago, not in the packed pews and the half dozen television cameras at St. Peter that day, but in plain and simple serving. Maybe even reaching down and picking up a dropped drumstick for a six-year-old boy. Jesus and his disciples were on the way to Jerusalem. They were taking the long and winding road because there were many lessons for them to learn. For instance, one day Jesus foreshadowed that he would suffer and die when he got to Jerusalem. Ironically, soon enough, the disciples got caught up in a heated argument over which one of them would be voted the most he pressed them. What was all that commotion about? You could imagine how sheepish they felt. No one could look them in the eye. Jesus told the disciples to sit down, and he promptly, and he promptly gave them a lesson in leadership. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he showed them what he meant by taking a little child in his arms. If you want to be great, he said, go and find someone about, well, 28 inches tall who's barely begun to walk. Or go and find a teenager with purple hair and a bit of an attitude and befriend those young people like it's the most important job in the whole world. I'm sure Jesus caught his disciples off guard. At the end, no, they were looked upon as gifts of God who would be of use someday to take over the family business, to look after their parents in their old age, to have children of their own and continue on the family name. But in the meantime, they didn't count for much. And as Jesus followed up on the disciples' bickering, he cradles the child in his arms, and he encourages them to become small. Whoever wants to be great must be last of all and a servant of all. In fact, if you welcome a little child in my name, it will be like you're welcoming me. So what is Jesus really saying here? 
he seems to suggest that you might need to get down on the floor with never forget that Hannah is not a filler she's the main event opening up yourself to her is every bit as good for your soul as finishing a project going for a walk or reading the Bible important as this sounds I think Jesus might be taking this even further Keep in mind, little Hannah can't buy you anything. She may not remember your name the next time she sees you. She has no status, no influence, just a special greatness in God's eyes. And you can work on your own greatness by learning this simple lesson. It's what you do when you think no one is looking with someone who can't guarantee a reward that ushers you into the very presence of small town in Kansas. I quickly discovered that the work of pastoral ministry can be quite taxing. I get to the end of the day and want nothing more than a little peace and quiet. And to be honest, there weren't many places to find it. But the only place for me was a large vegetable garden we'd planted in a vacant lot next to the parsonage. And there I could weed and hoe to my heart's content. Then little eight-year-old Christine moved in across the street. And almost every time I was in the garden, Christine would come over and talk to me. Hello, how are you doing? She'd ask. What are you working on? Why are you growing carrots? What's a zucchini? I just wanted to weed my zucchini in peace, but Christine wouldn't let me. Even so, I found myself grumbling. Why couldn't opportunities to serve come at a more convenient time? Then one day, everything changed. Or maybe I should say, I was changed. I was sitting on the front steps. The windows to Christine's house were wide open. I heard her parents get into a loud argument. They were yelling, cursing, and fighting. It was scary and ugly. And sure enough, a few minutes later, the screen door opened up, and eight-year-old Christine came shuffling out the door and across the street. Only this time, her big brown eyes were filled with tears. Hello, she said. What are you doing? Are you going to work in the garden today? And then I knew. Of her own in a crazy, mixed-up world. And spending a little time together in my garden was exactly the right thing to do, both for her and for me. Friends, I have a feeling that Jesus wasn't talking only about children that day with his disciples. He was talking about any of the little ones in our world, those with no status and few friends and little influence. He was picturing an elderly woman in a nursing home with no family coming to visit, a neighbor who keeps in touch and keeps to himself much of the time, a teenager who's struggling with depression. If you want to follow me and even be great, Jesus tells us, start by making yourself time with them and say hello to me. Amen.
drawn together by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the Church, God's good creation, and all who are in need. Lord Jesus, thank you for showing us how to serve. Give us eyes and ears and hearts that are open to the needs of others. And when it is fitting, help us to be small. Hear us, O God. We ask for guidance and direction for the transition team. Help us to build on the work that's already been done and to take whatever steps that seem most important now. Hear us, O oh God. Be with farmers in the fields and their families as those combines work and as the harvest is gathered in. Keep them safe. Help them to have a minimum of complications and may that work bring much rich harvest for this world. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for all who are calling upon you for Strabon Lindy. Chase Raisler, Sue V, Joanne Overbo, Linda Grosskreit, Brett Niebuhr, and those we name in our hearts now to you. And we add a special prayer for Deb Wilner and family as she's been put on hospice and is nearing the end of life. Hear us, O oh God. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, Holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to take a moment and share a sign of peace with those nearby. I would invite the congregation to be seated and for the transition team to come forward for our commissioning. Their names are on the back, so take a look. There are eight of us, and I know that there's lots going on right now with Harvest. So here they are, and um, please hear these words. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. This is a season of transition at Good Shepherd. A process of orientation and becoming. A time of remembering and reformation. A time for considering what was and what can still be. A time for giving thanks and for asking God to help and guide us. Members of the transition team, you have been selected by the church council to notice, name, and nurture what is necessary for an intentional, healthy, faithful interim process. To pay careful attention to the challenges and opportunities during this liminal season at Good Shepherd. Will you curate safe and trustworthy conversation so that members of this community can share their joys and sorrows, disappointments and dreams, if so, answer, we will and we ask God to help and in purpose as a congregation, which has been true, what is no longer true, and what can become true, and what can still be true. If so, answer, we will and we ask God to help and guide us.
Will you model a commitment to and curiosity for our mutual ministry and future together? For the sake of the people you serve and the next steps in the interim process, if so, we will and we ask God to help and guide us. May the God who abides in every season grant you the courage and compassion to do these things through Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, pour out your Holy Spirit on Nancy Kruger, Brian Schultz, Jim Stern, Jalen Stangler, Pat O. Trust that your spirit is the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. Amen. Let's give them a round of applause for their good work. And you may go in peace. As we get ready to receive our offering, a moment of thanks. We recently spent $519 at Ron's Plumbing and Heating to replace our sump pump. We needed those sump pumps when we actually got rain around here, so I'm sure it's coming back one of these days. We're grateful to have it, grateful to have it working. Your giving makes a difference. Thank you. Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Our Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, and it's given for you. Do this in remembrance of me the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, walk with us on this journey of faith and teach us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus welcomes you to this table. Come, here is your God. You may be seated. And you can certainly come forward for a blessing. Uh, we certainly would welcome any and all to come forward for God's love and nurture. As we get ready to serve, there is a cup that you will need to take in the middle. If you want a glass of grape juice, one is available for you to take. And there's a gluten-free wafer also for you to take if you prefer that. We will start on this side. There will be bread and there will be wine. And then there's a, a basket for you to place the empties in. And then we'll come to this side. Come for all things are made ready.
Let us pray. Holy God, you have welcomed us in this meal and fed us with dignity at our table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand for our blessing. Keep you and give you peace. Amen.